Welcome all of you. Very good to see you all. Uh, very brief introductions, please, starting with you, Robert. I'm Robert Massey. I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Royal Astronomical Society. Thank you. Hello, I'm Man Dowling. I'm President of the Royal Academy of Engineering and a Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Cambridge University. Brilliant. Uh, I'm Neil Hall. I'm Director of the Earlham Institute and Professor of Genomics at the University of East Anglia. In Norwich. In Norwich, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, sorry, that's everyone. <laughs> Impartial chair. <laughs> a fine city. Uh, good morning, my name is Charlene Griffiths. I'm Chief Operating Officer at the Institute of Cancer Research. Thanks very much. Now, uh, you, you'll have seen that the previous panel overran, uh, so if you could keep your comments succinct, we'd appreciate it, and please try to avoid answering if you think somebody else has answered uh, the points you want to make. So if I could start, uh, many of the submissions that we've received uh, call for an increase in the quality-related uh, uh, element of funding. Uh, do you agree? Um, and what would be an effective balance between quality-related and, and the project-based uh, funding? Uh, what would it look like if, we, if you think it needs to change from where it is at the moment? Who wants to start? So we definitely agree that the quality related funding needs um, attention and given the conversations we heard in the previous session, um, I would strongly encourage us to protect that and recognise the value it adds to um, biomedical research. As a research intensive institute, I can't overstate how important quality related funding is for our research to um, undertake the uh, discoveries that to defeat cancer. We have around 1,100 staff and scientists working um, primarily on research, and QR funding allows us to do what project or charitable or other funding will not, and that is to underpin all of the other kinds of funding we have with brilliant infrastructure, um, uh, exploration of areas that grant funding might not um, undertake, and also to allow us to provide stability for some of our senior scientists in their delivery. So quite simply, yeah. um, it's the bedrock of um, the work that we do. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, Anne and then Neil. Um, so the, the, the QR element yeah. is, is assessed on through, through, the, through the ref. So it's yeah. assessed on a retrospective look of what um, universities, research organisations have done. It plays a really important role, and I would agree with that. It gives um, continuity of funding but it places the hands in the universities to take a strategic view of what they're doing. So it, 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 it's important. Um, if we're trying to reach the 2.4%, is it the most important thing we should be doing with the additional funding? Um, I would say not. And you, we've, we've heard, I sat in on the previous session, if you really want to get to the 2.4%, you need to encourage business investment in R&D. I don't believe you do that through the QR element. That, although it is important for that underpinning capability, you do that to focusing on the Understood. innovation end. And do you have any? View, do any that. of you have any view about what the ratio ought to be between the two elements, the QR and the uh, project related? <laughs> well, it's very hard That's to talk good. about ratios. To me, I think the QR element's about right where it is now. The government's made a commitment to increase the its expenditure in R and D, and I actually believe we're going to use that as gearing to get to the 2.4%, the increase ought to be going more at the innovation side, and that's going to mean at the grant um, uh, and strategic initiative side. Great. Neil? So I, I have a probably a very specific perspective on it, because I'm at a BBSRC-funded institute, which receives no QR funding whatsoever. <laughs> Essentially, all of our funding either comes through uh, uh, strategic programme grants um, uh, from the BBSRC or through response mode funding or special initiatives. Now, the, the, the problem that creates is um, the point of it, part of the point of an institute is it has some continuity and strategic funding and, uh, and creates infrastructure for the uh, research community as a whole. Uh, and we do that through our natural capabilities. Essentially, with the loss of what the equivalent of QR funding for an institute, which would be non hypothecated money, which you could use strategically or to maintain infrastructure has disappeared almost completely. And I think most institutes in that situation feel it's very difficult to take a strategic view. Uh, we are uh, essentially uh, uh, um, competing for money most of the time. And project-based funding does have the, the security that it's, it's generally peer-reviewed, you know that it's of high quality, but there is a cost 
that comes mm. with that, essentially, 80% of it, 90% of it is never funded, and there's a huge infrastructure underlying it. Is but, it a particular problem for institutes like yours rather yes. than universities? So a lot of institutes now have become essentially parts of universities, but, mm. uh, and that is one way in which you can start getting QR back through. But that means, firstly, that you, uh, as you say, that you take the, the, the university has a strategic interest in what the institute is doing and, and continues to support it through the QR funding they receive. Um, but also, it, it also puts a different pressure on the institute, you know, whether it is that, that essentially what used to be people spending 100% of their time on research or get involved in teaching or university administration. So you, you lose the strategic long-term planning, which is what research institutes are for, um, whether it be through the containment facilities at Purbright, our national capabilities, the Roslyn Institute, animal facilities, those... Are, those are infrastructures maintained by institutes um, which make the UK an attractive place to come and work, and okay. that's really important right at the moment. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, I mean, to add to what some of what's been said, um, I think the reflection from the members we have is that most of them are based in universities, is that actually QR funding will come into the institution at the top level. It's not necessarily the case that a high-performing research group gets to see that, and that depends on the attitude of the institution. So, yes, it's incredibly important. It provides the financial stability that you've heard, but I think we shouldn't kid ourselves that it necessarily rewards the, the research groups that are performing at the highest levels. It's, you know, it's, it's part of their job to bring that money in, but it isn't necessarily something they benefit from directly. OK, thank you. What evidence should UKRI collect to determine whether future changes to the balance between the two sides of the dual support system have a positive effect? We're really um, happy to be working with David Sweeney and the Research England team um, and other colleagues to be providing data around a range of things um, into, into their assessment. In particular, we're interested in painting a really clear picture of how we balance the costs of doing excellent research, um, which we're committed to, to obviously continuing. Um, so I think in terms of data, actually understanding the interplay between all of the factors and players in the research ecosystem, whether they be for us um, a combination of pharmaceutical input and government funding and indeed charitable funding. So for, for us a really important assessment would be looking at all of the components in the research ecosystem and taking a holistic view to make sure it stacks up and can support the very best research to make sure we keep our um, position as a global leader in R&D. Thank you. Um, uh, Neil, you've talked about the sort of effect on your institute of a sort of reduction or disappearance of QR um, uh, funding for your type of institute. Yeah. Is it, uh, and indeed the sort of impact of this affects both, your, both of your institutes, I guess, um, can you quantify that impact at all? Is it possible to...? Well, ARTS is a fairly new institute, and I don't think that we... Um, you never you experienced. You never ex really, really got the benefits of what you could call uh, a QR income in its, its purest form. Uh, though our core income, which is the strategically funded income, though it is designed to deliver specific research outcomes, uh, has dropped fr from 71% of our total income to 44% of our total income. Though our in income has, in, in total, has generally grown, but that's because people are going after project grants. At my my concern would be primarily that, the, that we lose the focus of what we are here to do, which is to deliver strategic um, science for the BBSRC around data-driven biology into agriculture and food and health. Uh, and inevitably, once um, essentially researchers become almost uh, sort of self-employed, <laughs> to going after money uh, uh, where they can find it to support their groups, then the st strategy is lost uh, and... Um, What's so, the impact then on the nation? Um, well, th like, like I said, I think that, for example, where our institute was set up primarily by the BBSRC because they saw a gap that affected the competitive of UK bioscience around computational biology, uh, 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 about the skills in, in, in maths, in, et cetera, in the biosciences. And our job has basically been to fill that gap and provide technologies and training and also to provide research to, 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 to bridge it. Um, uh, and so that strategic um, area will slowly be eroded. As, uh, for example, you know, we do now make a, a, a large um, component of our non-hypothecated income through contract research to large agricultural industry, which is, which is good, uh, I think. Uh, but um, 
I think it will affect what we can deliver to the UK research base, which I think is what we are there to do. Shall we? So in um, response to painting a bit of a picture mm. of the impact of um, yeah. this, for, for our institute, um, I'll just give you a sense of the gap um, uh, in terms of funding between project funding and making it stack up. So in 2017-18, we spent £25.6 million pounds filling the shortfall um, that underpinned yeah. Grant Research in our institute, which is clearly substantial. And so for that reason, we'd be strongly advocating there's an increase in QR funding mm. available, because that, uh, we do everything from basic research right mm. through to the clinical um, end of things, so bench to bed, uh, bedside. And for us, that's a part of the magic of the Institute, is what's helped power so many cancer research advances over decades in its 100-year history. That gap is, in, um, for us, a hugely substantial. And if you add on to that, that in the, both the, um, the research assessment exercise and the most recent REF, the Institute came top for uh, research quality and impact, and yet substantially re received a, a 10% and an 8% reduction in its QR funding, even though it came top of the mm. table. For us, that's a really worrying direct measure of the impact that we're having to sustain our research, and we would advocate more funding. Thank you. Vicky? Thank you. So these are really questions to Deman and, and the engineers, and they're following up from the panel one discussion we had about innovation support. Um, when you look at the innovation side, which you, you said is less funded than maybe some other countries, um, do you see innovation having the equivalent to the dual support? Um, so the sort of block funding and then the project-based funding. Do you see the R&D tax credit as being like the block funding element to that? <laughs> I hadn't thought of it in that way. Um, I, I'm not sure that's a particularly helpful way of, okay. of, of, um, of thinking. Well, perhaps because, like QR funding, the R&D tax credits are retrospective. Mm. Um, uh, and, and so, as we've been hearing, one of the problems with tax credits, it doesn't really help the SMEs who are really resource and uh, people poor, time poor. Um, and probably haven't got that much income to uh, uh, get tax credit against. Um, I, I think really it does provide for the for the large corporates the tax credits provide a, a, a good infrastructure, but um, the, um, the the rather more direct at, you know actual at point of uh, undertaking innovation um, grant kind of uh, collaborative. collaborative um, support is, I think, far more important. That's more important. Uh, the, How do you see delivery. the difference between an innovation policy and a business support policy? I mean, what's the as a general support policy for an innovative business? <laughs> I mean, I, um, <laughs> so I suppose it, what 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 is what is is, is innovation? Um, and um, I. I sat in on the on the previous session, and I think what's described when you actually get to very close to delivery, uh, to the, uh, um, the 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 product almost ready to go to market, that's clearly in the business's um, hands. But in the middle, between where university research councils um, interaction with research stops, uh, before you, it, there's a, still a very risky stage. And what we know is, is that in that stage, investment in, in innovation doesn't necessarily bring the benefits to the business that was involved in that investment. And that's why there's a role for public support in that, that risky stage, which is moving um, ideas forward, but it's not quite clear how they will be commercialised. Someone needs to be doing it. Businesses will co-invest in there, but they're not willing usually to take 100%. Um, I think there is a difference. Uh, so, what around innovation with support? One's trying to get ideas across that commercialisation um, um, well, gap, um, and um, innovative businesses will be stepping up to be involved in that. And that, but that is not quite the same as business support. It, it's supporting ideas which uh, businesses involved may want to be using but it actually is also just benefiting that pool of knowledge. So do you think there isn't enough clarity on what the objectives of the innovation policies are? Do there, does it get sort of... I, I think at that? the heart, there's just not enough money going into it um, okay. in, in the UK. Um, we have a really um, strong 
um, research base in the UK, and we do, and we have, we do invest in that, whether it's through QR or through the, through the research councils and grants. Um, at the innovation side, the public investment in that in the UK um, is is smaller than our competitive nations. And is that the public procurement side of the? Investment it's a whole or? range of, of things. So the uh, the academy recently, um, with the two point four percent in mind undertook a, a study where we, we asked sometimes the CEOs, but more often the CETOs, the chief technology officers of um, engineering businesses that, that invest in innovation, what makes them choose where they do it in the world? What, what, what are the levers? Um, and um, lots of good things came out. And you've heard of, obviously, the, the, the strength of our research base is one of them. But time and time again, the lack of public funding to co-invest in innovation uh, came up as an issue. They do like the tax credits, but we're also looking for direct investment. And was in that innovation. in particular sectors? Well, so looking across engineering, but engineering in pins is through a, a whole range of sectors. Um, in your submission to us, you spoke about um, changes to Innovate UK's core budget and a decrease coming in next financial year. What sort of impact do you think that could We happen? think that's really, really serious. Um, so um, it's great that we have investment in the catapults and in the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. And Innovate UK is managing some of, of, of those. And that's good because Innovate UK has a business focus. Their customers are businesses and the businesses should be involved in having influence in those but up till now, Innovate UK has also been there for, for, for businesses across all sectors to, to actually come in with, with, uh, 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 with opportunities for, for, for co-funding. And that's been squeezed. So just at this time where we want for businesses to be co-investing more in, in R&D, the um, open um, part of Innovate UK's um, funding that is, is but isn't it because more of that's been given to catapults? But that the catapults are in very particular targeted areas. They're good things, but really we should be scaling up that, the whole of the innovation uh, investment that we're making. So we are scaling up the whole of the innovation investment, but it's just going through. You'd say keep more of it in the uh, well, I, I, fund. So the industrials. It, I think part. What's not clear is how much of the industrial strategy fund is actually going to innovation at the moment. Okay. Because it, it's taken challenge um, uh, headings, a lot of it is fundamental research within that challenge um, area. Um, I think the, the issue with, with, with innovation is, is it's, once you get to that stage, it's inherently more expensive you could, um, be, because the it's around how, how actually do you scale up. You can't scale up uh, or even probe the ways of scaling up without spending more money than a small lab-based research project. Mm -hmm. So you need to, to prioritise and it, it really ought to have a higher level of investment. Whereas, you know, Innovate UK's budget is, is small on the scale so of the other research is, councils. Is, so, so I just want to make it clear. So the Innovate UK funding pot has gone down. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's less money for innovation, but we don't know because it's We don't not know clear because the other money is in the pot. So that would the recommendation be to try and make sure that the money for innovation throughout is increasing, oh, not decreasing? I think a really helpful thing would be to have more transparency about where, um, if you like, at what TRL levels, but you know where the, 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 the pot is going. And on something headed industrial strategy. Can I bring in Graham fund? very quickly Could and then we, back to Vicky? Um, have clarity again on, on, on actually what type of projects are being funded with that. Graham? Yep, it, it, it may surprise you, but I, I've seen a lot of witnesses on this committee and I've never once heard them say that they, they've got too much funding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is. <laughs> <laughs> there is never enough funding, but it, it isn't one of the problems cultural? There was a, a, a study two or three years ago looking at the success of innovation and businesses around Cambridge University, and what that seemed to indicate was that a lot of the success was not the traditional model of sort of getting through the valley of death. It was actually when businesses had a problem 
taking the super clever people out of the laboratories in Cambridge, putting them in the business. They learnt about the business, the business learnt from the clever people, and both benefited from it. So isn't, isn't there a cultural problem about getting academics looking at problems as they actually exist in uh, active businesses? Well, I couldn't agree more, and I, 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 think, there, there, I think there are two elements to that. Um, one is, <coughs> you know, we talk about curiosity-driven research as if it's only pure research that academics come up and dream the ideas themselves. I think there's curiosity in all sorts of things, and you only have to dangle in front of an academic researcher an interesting problem, and they're curious to find the answer to it. And businesses have a huge number of <coughs> problems, and that's something that I looked at in a, in a review I did for government a couple of years ago on business-university research collaborations. Uh, I think um, we, we have a false um, a lack of respect, really, of research that, that's driven to solve these interesting problems that businesses and, in, um, and industries um, have. And all you need is, well, all you need, but if we break down the barriers, if we have more mobility between academia uh, and, and industry, um, then actually you can get some smart brains, um, both in industry and, and, and academia, but, but mm. thinking together about solving things that will have real commercial debt. Uh, Very impact. brief uh, comment from Neil and Robert, and then I don't know whether Vicky has any more questions, but we are tight I'll just on say, time. relevant to that, is I think you're absolutely right that academics would have a, have a lot to give to, to, to companies, etc., but... I think one of the problems with that is it's actually really, really hard work maintaining a research program in a university or an institute environment. And I, I worry that part of it is that I think most academics don't want to take their foot off the gas of their day job necessarily to do that when they don't necessarily understand or know what the rewards would be and what the implications of failure might be um, it, going into industry. So one of the, the reasons I think there's some low uptake of certain... Uh, mobility grants that you can get is that people feel that they can't take their eye off their day job for a second, and that's maybe part of the uh, uh, and, and QR. Is that an potentially argument for not and true? Yeah, and uh, I think that having some secure core or QR funding is one of the ways that you could actually uh, help that to happen. I see, to give them then yeah, a bit some, more yeah, sense well, of freedom. <coughs> yeah. I mean, it's because the, the project grant funding is yeah, a treadmill. It's a Essentially. Uh, Robert? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question about the culture of academia as a whole. All I would say is that in astronomy and space science, we, we catalogued dozens of examples of people who had done exactly what you described mm -hmm. and taken very basic concepts in research out into industry and worked, you know, to set up spin out companies, which is one side of it, and also, but also deployed their ideas to solve completely unrelated problems. I mean, you know, one example if, if you want a 100 year time scan, um, GPS uh, derives from general relativity, and a UK-led expedition verified that 100 years ago next year. You know, that's a time, obviously, no one could really have predicted the consequence of that was going to be that we'd have smartphones and just-in-time movement of goods and so on. Um, you know, another esoteric one is that uh, cosmic ray signals, the timing of that was used to improve Scottish railway timetabling. I'm not going to comment on anybody who's used Scottish trains and whether that's had a tangible difference, but the technology was used in that way. So I was some giggling from the Scottish <laughs> yeah, Exactly, I was going to say, I hesitate to mention things like that, having not used them recently. But, you know, I think it's reasonable to say that, I don't know there's an unwillingness on the part of academics to do this. There is undoubtedly a timing issue, and if you have to maintain a high research profile, teach students and do all the other things you're expected to, then, you know, there needs to be some kind of buyout of time if you want those sort of transfers to happen. Can I Thank you. I want to bring Charmaine in, and I'm conscious we're horribly overrun, but uh, come in very quickly, Charmaine. So just in a nutshell, we're, um, the Institute has a portfolio of pharma partnerships primarily, and they're really good and thorough relationships and robust relationships mm. with pharma partners that enable us to take um, discoveries through to patients ultimately. We've really valued the um, higher education innovation funding mm. to enable that to happen, to help us get capacity in the organisation, to help us train up our people. And we've actually got a good flow of people back and forth between academia and um, pharmaceuticals that helps adjust that cultural um, expectation both ways. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to add, we mustn't forget the, the students in this, and particularly the PhD students, because the, the, the skills that they're learning as part of, of, of their their research actually extremely valuable in industry 
And uh, I, I understand about uh, academics and being uh, pushed for time. I've, I've been there. But actually, if every student, a PhD student, had to spend three months working in industry as part of their PhD, mm. uh, and actually seeing how the skills they had were valued and, and recognised in industry, I think we would find more of those who had been doing quite esoteric research projects actually looking to a career in industry rather than perhaps hanging on uh, for an academic post. The, the BBSRC does that. They, they have to spend three months in industry. Hang on, this one quick question for Graham has <laughs> unleashed an enormous discussion. Vicky, can I bring you back in and then to finish your yeah, I think I'm basically done, but I do want to hold that idea about the PhD involving some industry yeah. placement. Um, do they do that in Germany? Do they do that in other countries? I think a number of PhDs do that, and the, 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 the I-case scheme um, from the research councils, which, which is only a subset of the students, ha has, has placements, but Best practice it would vary. Um, thank you. I, 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 oh, is this my set of questions? Yes. Yes, yes. good. <laughs> thank you. We got that. I'd lost track of who. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've caught your eye by accident. Um, Right, thank you. I just want to go back to this issue of the balance of funding and how it's applied. And it is a discussion that you hear probably constantly about where the balance should lie between basic funding for basic research and funding for applied research. And some of the submissions that we have had have indicated that they are concerned that too much of the funding at the moment is going towards the applied end of the spectrum. Firstly, is that your perception collectively? Secondly, does it matter? And if it does, why? Um, I can just say Please. something. I could just echo uh, the examples from physics. If you, if you, uh, I worry that if that there's a sense of watching the previous session that the, we feel that the point of research is 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 innovation and translation. And really isn't. And in genomics, where I work, I could say Crick, Watson, Franklin, they weren't really thinking about translating their work. I, I don't think Fred Sanger, who invented the method of sequencing, thought about the translation of his work. Or even taking modern day's example, you know, uh, Shankar Balasubramanian, who invented the, the technology which is used for clinical sequencing. He was doing basic research on enzyme kinetics in, in a chemistry department. And they, those people built a multi-trillion dollar industry of personalised medicine. So I think the, the fundamental point of research is that this basic understanding of, 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 of natural processes, in, 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 certainly in my field. And um, I, I, so I think getting, if we do that right, I think a lot of the problems about how industry would engage with UK scientists would probably be, probably be solved. My only... I, and it's, I'm, I would worry if the government was taking my advice on the best way to, to or how much money to put in innovation <laughs> spending. But, the, but uh, I would say, one of the, from the other side of the fence, people working in basic science, it seems hugely complicated. Uh, with, with, uh, uh, there are many, many, many different ways that you can apply for this money. You have to get different levels of, of co-funding in different forms from industry. Um, and I think for someone working in that basic uh, sort of, uh, uh, underpinning science field, sometimes it's actually quite intimidating. Like I say, when you feel that your primary job is to make sure your lab keeps in jobs and that you can still get the papers out that means people fund your grants in the future. So I, I think simplifying the, 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 that whole the interface would, would be hugely um, useful. I would agree with what Neil just said in terms of protecting the space for that basic research yeah. and the examples you gave I thought were brilliant. It's the same yeah. in cancer research, the things that are happening in labs um, yeah. right in our institute today will be the things we thank them for in years to come and that space must be protected and the funding for that. I think um, I mentioned the high, um, high funding has been incredibly useful. I think other schemes are quite complicated as Neil described and we would welcome some simplification <laughs> and recommend there be some simplification of the ways in which yeah. you can connect um, uh, with opportunities uh, to, to innovate. So, yeah, protection of HIFE and, uh, yeah. and other monies, but also Robert. simplification. Mm. I mean, it's, it, I wouldn't want to comment on the amount of money being invested in, in applied research, except that, you know, clearly we regard growth in that as a good thing inherently. However, it, the fact is that 
the investment in basic research in our area is pretty much flatlining and has been for about a decade. So if you talk to, I mean, I talked to the chair of the grants panel last week about this just to verify that, and the level has been about 29 million in grants funded in over three years, so about 10 million a year for something like a decade now. So there has been a real issue for groups, not least because inflation in a whole range of areas, uh, things like estates costs for universities have risen a lot in that time. Um, and it's not very sustainable, actually. So you can, you can run that on for a long time. I suspect this applies to a lot of areas of what you might call basic research, that actually they look and see very targeted schemes. And those, those are welcome for the people who access them, clearly. But if you run those at the same time as throttling off the basic research base, then you, you know, you'll reach a problem at some point. You the pipeline will yeah. <coughs> dry up. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you exactly, and you know, one could make the same argument about, for example, capital investment, where the batteries not included thing still applies, probably pretty much as it did a decade ago, where we see ministerial announcements, welcome as they are, to invest in large-scale international projects, opening of new centres, and yet actually, if you talk to the people working in those places, they struggle to recruit the staff they need to make them run. Um, you know, there are examples in STFC, for example, around the operation of their facilities that are quite well documented. If you look at their annual accounts, it talked about the cutback in the program, the breadth of the program of about a third over the last decade. You know, these are serious issues and it would be unfortunate if we saw the desire to reach that 2.4%, which I, I don't believe could be achieved without a significant uplift in public funding, happening at the same time as some of the areas where we currently excel being throttled off. I think that would be deeply regrettable because these are, these are you know, areas of real excellence to the UK. They supply many of the uh, PhD students into industry that we heard about earlier, you know, about nine-tenths nine of people pursuing PhDs in these subjects will move out into the wider economy, taking their skills with them. If you don't have those areas, you won't see that kind of STEM attractor effect either. It becomes a less inspirational sector for people. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're all not entirely following my plea for brevity. Uh, uh, I know you've all got an awful lot to say and it's appreciated, but uh, we are tight on time. Anne. Well, I'm not sure if the distinction between basic and applied is particularly helpful. Um, I mean, all, 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 all research is trying to answer, answer questions, um, and, and it, it, it is just research. And, and I suppose we would refer in, in my academy more to, to use-inspired research. It just depends where you're, you're targeting, where you're thinking you're, you're, um, the, the research might end up. To me, a more important distinction is between the research and the development end. Um, and if all we do is the research, then in a way we're making a great donation to the rest of the world because yeah. we have a strong research base, we publish our results, it's all marvellous. Uh, but you've got to do more if you're going to capitalise on the, what's the fruit of that research. Uh, and that means really more on the development of the innovation side than, than research. Thank you. I, I suppose, therefore, the only real final question I have around this is, you know, is this something UKRI should measure and try and quantify to see if the balance is right or just let the system get on with it? Um, uh, I guess that if the, maybe the, the way uh, I think it's a really good point about where to draw the distinction and I guess there is a distinction between investigator driven research um, uh, academic driven research and industry driven research potentially and w which was going to which received different st strands of government funding and I and my answer is I, I think yes I think it's really important that we ensure that investigator driven research is protected at some level and I don't don't ask me what that should be necessarily but um, and I'll be biased <laughs> but, so, but, but I think it, it is important that uh, that is protected and, and uh, you know I've visited other countries where it's very very heavily based on the pull of industry and I think that what you what you see then is a lot of the young people leaving that country to go and research somewhere else because they want to go to the world famous labs which are generally doing this kind of underpinning research or academic led research. Any other? I'll just add thank you that yes I think UK and RA needs to look at it but look at it as an ecosystem. We describe the pipeline and not drawing up and it needs to take the, have a look at the whole picture. So some of the comments or the problems that people have tried to highlight in that are being overstated, I think, is what you're saying. Depends on the problem you're referring to. <laughs> well, th this balance between yeah. you know, applied and basic. Yeah. What I'm it's trying to get to is it, it, I'm not sensing that you're all saying there is a problem with this. Yeah. And that actually... I think there is in the sense that you know the growth in R&D funding, the announced public investment, has been in very targeted funds. So that is a problem right. with the basic research. Or, or some, some areas of it anyway, that the core resource funding 
within the research councils, at least for the ones we deal with, has been fairly flat. And, and that's set against an otherwise positive news about growth in R&D spending. So, so there is an issue there, How you know, whether that's defined as being an issue of balance or whether it's about, I think, as you know, my colleague made a point about growing the ecosystem as a whole, that's the area to look at. You shouldn't, if you talk about growing the R&D budget, then that needs to be holistic. So I have to say yes, because the point is, I think, that if the, the research council funding, um, you know, the, the basic research council funding is flat, which it has been certainly for us at best, and you see a growth in this uh, targeted industrial strategy type money or GCRF type of money, then the, the net result of that is people who were doing basic research tend to be gravitate towards these more targeted calls. And... It's, that will have an effect long term. Essentially, there'll be fewer of these you know, uh, fundamental discoveries coming through the system, in my view. Mm. Yes. Thank brilliant. you. I'm going to have to leave you. Yeah, question. brilliant. No, thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Graham. Oh. Uh, can I ask Robert, you, you made the case that astronomy uh, has lost out in its, its funding in your... Can, can you explain how that has impacted on... Uh, the Greenwich Royal Observatory. Um, that's, a, that's a very specific point, actually. Um, I, it's just to exemplify what you I used to work there a long time ago, but, it, yeah. but it's... Um, well, I mean, the current Observatory in Greenwich is actually a public engagement establishment anyway, mm. so it doesn't do much in the way of core, what you describe as core research. Um, if you take the field as a whole, um, which I think is probably more pertinent, the, uh, the issue is simply that there's a throttling off of the number of postdoc numbers, there's a throttling off of the time academics can spend doing that core research because the way the grants program works is that academics are, are given a kind of buyout. Or, I mean, they are supposed to spend a certain amount of time which we do research anyway, nominally, and the grants they receive are supposed to co cover some, some of that time. So what you see is that there's a diminution in that, that actually the, uh, you know, it's down, I think, on average from SDFC to around 15% of their time, which is barely sustainable if you think about 15% of your week being spent on this kind of activity, then it's very difficult to deliver very much within that. Um, in terms of the, the impact on somewhere like Greenwich, and I guess that, you know, they're innovative people there, they look for exciting ideas, there's no shortage of those coming through, and given that it's a very international science, they have plenty of material to draw on. Uh, however, I suppose if it looks like a less healthy field to go into, if you're, say, you know, considering your options at school or you're even looking at it as an undergraduate student, then you will see a, a fall off in that. I mean, at the moment, undergraduate numbers are actually very healthy. If, if anything, they're booming at the moment. I think they were up 18% in astronomy over last year on the basis of the figures we have. So that, that's not the issue. My worry is that people um, come into the field, there are fewer PhD places, and actually that you see a throttling up of ideas and that people just take their ideas elsewhere. You know, if you want to inform innovation, then having a, a cadre of very highly skilled, highly talented people coming through the postgraduate system is a, a very good way to do it, because we all understand that the, the majority of those people move out into wider industry. I mean, this, the predecessor committees of this committee have looked at both the funding of particle physics and astronomy since the PPAR uh, uh, Research Council was um, abolished. Do you, do you share the committee, or the previous committee's uh, view that that funding, were, that, one, that that's the main source of the problem, and, and two, that that funding, both in capital and revenue, has never been replaced? I think that's fair. I mean, certainly since the financial crash, it's essentially been flat. And, you know, what you have seen is that uh, astronomers are extremely good at going out to European sources and substituting that, if you like. So I think uh, something like 30% of the resource funding they now get comes from those kind of places like the European Research Council. And there is obviously a worry that, you know, after 29th of March, it's during that it's switched off, that what happens yeah. instead... Um, but yes, I think it, it probably does still derive from the formation of P Park, even though that was a decade ago. When, when Paul Nurse looked at <coughs> setting up UKRI, he, he noticed, as we'd noticed, that uh, basically the, uh, the proportion of funding to each of the research councils had stayed constant uh, for a long time, whereas particle physics and astronomy, because the research council had been abolished, uh, had lost out. In the new system, do you see any signs that any of that lost funding will be replaced? Is it still, in the world of uh, science funding, is it still a live issue? Yes, it's very much a live issue. Um, you know, 
the fact is the number of postdocs supported is not very sustainable now. Uh, there are real, we're reaching a crunch point. If you carry on with the being members of big international programs, which I think we should, then you need to have people who are employed to do the science to exploit those facilities. Uh, if you don't have them, then you know you have to argue about what the point of the membership of those programs is. We don't just want to be in a situation where we are, say, members of the European Southern Observatory, the European Space Agency, where we support projects, I don't like Gaia, that just mapped a billion stars in the galaxy and done massive work in data science, and not to be able to exploit those. And you know, at the moment, we do see the benefits, I think, of the well, well over a decade ago of making some of those decisions and seeing the science that's flowed from that. My worry now would be that, you know, we are, say, hosting the headquarters of the Square Kilometre Array, fantastic global radio observatory. You know, this is the thing that will have many times current internet traffic to work. And yet, you know, you could see a situation where UK groups can't exploit that properly. Right. And, and the, the second part of the question, do you think the new structures uh, will mean that the live issue of that historic unfairness of funding uh, will be rectified in any way? It's, it's early days. Um, without, without, look, without growth, at least to keep it in line with that overall ecosystem, without seeing that kind of reasonable shared growth in investment, then I don't think the problem will go away. So, you know, it's, it, the structural issues... So you're, part you're it, not but. clear as to whether it will, the new structure will... No, be. <laughs> I think we haven't had clear messages on that, other than, other than that fundamental research doesn't get mentioned anything like as much because of the nature of the industrial strategy as you would expect, mm. as, for want of a better word, applied research without wishing to open up that conversation again. <laughs> OK, yeah. good. No, that's fine, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Darren. Because I'm conscious of time, I'm going to assume that everybody agrees that the reduction in spending on capital from apparently 1.2 billion 10 years ago to 340 million now is a bad thing. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to ask very specifically for recommendations to this committee as to what more we can do to evidence and enhance uh, the output of capital spending as a, um, uh, in comparison to the amount of resource spending that goes in. How, how do we make the case for capital spending? So Neil, there is a roadmap for the research infrastructure that's being devised at the moment. I think that's a really positive thing. So I, I think that so looking out 10 years, saying what infrastructure do we require, um, what new infrastructure may we require in the future, and making sure that there's not redundancy and it's used efficiently, I think is a positive thing. My, my rec I mean, so I think actually there's been positive steps uh, in, in that. Um, the UKRI initiating that, I think, is one of the first things that happened. Um, it's been put together very quickly, which is kind of worrying, but, but, I, but I suppose my recommendation would be that that is used for financial planning and, some, and, a, and a budget is put aside, for want of a better word, for, to, 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 to support that at the moment. Uh, certainly, uh, as a, a, a core funded institute, a lot of our infrastructure comes in dribs of drabs of money which is left over the financial year. It makes it really difficult to be to plan, to be strategic and to spend that money efficiently. So, uh, so I think there's lots that can be done uh, to, to, to improve that. And yeah. Well, um, one thing we find with capital investment is that it's a very sticky form of public investment mm -hmm. in the sense that once you've invested in the capital then it tends to attract um, inward investment yes. um, and investment from companies on a year after year basis. So um, I think that's one good, it's a, a, you know, it's a, yeah. a good thing to do. But it's sticky in a good way. Yeah. Sticky, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but also you need to train people running it as well. And the catapults have provided quite a good way of being that interface to users who uh, want to use the capital Charming. located with them. So, so Darren, I completely agree that the, the reduction is something that concerns us deeply. And as a recipient of a recent UKR PIF grant to develop a new centre for cancer drug discovery within the Institute, we can really see the power of investing in, in those capital investments, both to um, give our researchers the kit and space they need to do the work, um, given the advances in technology and other, but also to attract world-class talent into the UK so that we retain our seat as a global leader, particularly in, um, in R&D. So in, in addition to the kind of tonic level that um, uh, Neil described of, of capital and infrastructure to keep the show on the road, those large, um, that roadmap and those large investments are very powerful and we'd advocate they're built into the growth plan for, for research investment. <coughs> to come and work with the kit that you 
the kit you have right. so it's an attractive offer right yeah. right it's it's constantly changing as, as i'm sure all of colleagues across the table the the environment's constantly changing the requirements of scientists to do cutting edge cancer research is is changed monthly let alone yearly sometimes and so creating um space that can accommodate that and attract the world's best talent into the uk to focus on our big cancer problems is, is huge for us and, and just to help us illustrate the case does anybody have an example that they're able to share with the committee where you've not been able to do something because of a lack of capital spending. Yeah. Well, I would say that so, um, and we've obviously made this case uh, recently in, in attracting the funding that not having world class facilities to um, develop cancer drugs and also then to partner appropriately with pharma. So, along with our clinical partner, the Royal Marsden, we um, are one of the world's top four. Uh, um, comprehensive cancer centres and not being able to equip and attract world-class um, clinical academics, academics and scientists to serve um, the, our kind of ambition and progress that research would, would be the case. Without that, would we be able to retain and attract the world's best talent and do the research we need to? No. Mm. So it's purely a talent question. Did Neil, did yeah. you have something? Yeah, it is, I mean, I think it's really difficult to say what you didn't do because you didn't have infrastructure. And I'll probably start it another way. I think that it's more... It's, it's becoming more of an issue now actually because of the amount of competition there is for excellent places that you can do research around the world. If you go to you know, many places in Asia and you look at the infrastructure, which is, you know, the, the, in my field in genomics, you go to, to China now, they have infrastructure that we co couldn't dream of, you know. To, to, so I could, there's, there's tons of things that we couldn't do because I don't have, uh, you know, a billion pounds to spend on a whole new institute. So, but, but it does mean that we are... Uh, but we are trying to compete <coughs> with the best talent in the world against places which have um, now far superior infrastructure to, to the, that we have in the UK. We have other advantages here, and, but, but mainly historical now, uh, and based on legacy rather than what is currently in the UK. So, I mean, I, I think, but so, but I think it's a good question, but very difficult one to answer. Sure. In sense, yeah. If you look at things as a ref and the you know, yeah. examples of where the UK has exploited capital projects and large infrastructure projects, you'll see plenty of examples of small businesses actually that have tapped into that. Perhaps not as many as we'd like, but that's an important thing. It's an exciting opportunity. But it also has a reasonably good regional consequences as well. I mean, I'm thinking, uh, you know. There's a company in North Wales that specialises in optics that supports the European Southern Observatory. I doubt they would exist without those contracts to get them going. So, you know, there are, I'm not saying that that's, that on its own is a reason for this kind of investment, but it's an important byproduct. And in my, in my area, I, um, so looking at combustion for next generation of aero engines, we have good research labs in the UK in universities, but when it comes to that next scale up, um, we don't have a UK facility that, that really can do that at, yeah. at, at pressure. And th those tests are done in, in Germany, um, in DLR. And um, then if that spins off problems, as, as whenever you do a, a scale up of something, it, it takes you right back to the fundamentals. It shows yeah. things you don't understand. Um, for European pro programs, we're currently able to be part of that. But, but the concern would be that then all those next ideas for, for research don't come back to the UK. Mm. I think uh, if you finish, Darren, uh, just very quickly from me before I bring in Martin, Neil, your written evidence sort of yeah. implied also that getting the balance right uh, between revenue and capital yes, exactly. uh, is critically important and that sometimes there's a mismatch uh, between the two which Often makes times, it harder yes, to <laughs> implement what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, there is, because um, uh, for reasons I don't fully understand, the, 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 because the money comes in different flavours, yes, we, we can get um, a sudden uh, um, availability of several million pounds to spend on infrastructure, but no um, money to spend on people to operate the infrastructure, to train people, so to use it, to run more projects. Up thinking and yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's a good example in, you know, in synthetic biology where you know, foundries were set up, but there was no money to run projects through them. And so that money is, I don't think, used to the best of its ability. I wouldn't say it was wasted, but it could, so much more could have been generated or derived from it. And I think there has to be joined up thinking about how that um, the infrastructure and the revenue that goes with right. it. Right. Yes. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. I think actually, sort of flowing on from that joined up thinking. I was my questions relate really to the charity research support fund and the and I know the evidence that the ICR. And again, we seem to have a, a, a capital 
uh, fund, um, and then the charities contribute to individual events, and, the, and whether or not there's, there's, a, there's a mismatch there. And indeed, I was, I was quite shocked to discover um, that in your submission you were saying that the charities sort of fail even to provide for maternity cover costs, where you're talking about the very essential people who are doing the research. So, really, um, I mean, the, 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 this is to you, Charmaine. I mean, what, what is the significance um, of the CRSF? And are the charities playing ball with their contributions? So, uh, a good question. In in terms of the institute, we are a proud partner with a number of charities um, yes. uh, in the UK and around the world. And of our, uh, our income, roughly half is grant income, and of that, around 65% comes from charities directly. So, charities such as Cancer Research UK and Breast Cancer Now. And we work with them really closely to ensure that we mm. use their money strategically mm. and as effectively as possible. Understandably, charities um, and charitable donors want to see their pound go to as much towards the direct research as is possible. And so the constraints around how we use that charitable funding are often on the direct costs of research. What they don't accommodate really is the running of laboratories, the paying of senior salaries and the kind of strategic investment. And so that does leave obviously a deficit and it is, um, it is the Charity Research Support Fund that um, addresses that. However, the, um, that, that fund um, was frozen for a number of years and for us in terms of balancing the books and making sure we can do excellent research well and in a sustainable fashion, what that's meant for, for ourselves and for other similar organisations is that the value of that fund has dropped from 34p in the pound in 2008 to 22p in the pound today. So we're seeing a significant shortfall and that's before inflationary pressures or other. Mm. So we, we're, we're lucky that we have other income streams we can draw on at this point for a period to, to, to mitigate that, but that does need ad addressing in the long term. Um, you're right, things like maternity costs um, fall to the host institutions, as do many of the other day-to-day -day operating funds. So we would strongly compel um, uh, the kind of review to look at increasing the value of the Charity Re um, Research Support Fund, partly because it leverages char more charitable funding as well. So partly the mitigation point of help us make the books balance to do mm -hmm. brilliant work. But also, we can get really excited about that research and help use that to help leverage more and more charitable funding. And it's not to say, obviously, that the contributions that, that people make to charities and charities then make to, to the research is not absolutely essential. Um, but would, could I invite you to suggest that perhaps a better understanding um, or towards the public about how the funds go in, how the, you know, how their one pound deposited in the box at the, the shop counter or whatever ends up, and that actually a better understanding that research is the coming together of many, many things, not just the roof over your head, not just the individual doing the research, but also the opportunity um, for colleagues to discuss things. A better understanding of that by the public, might that help unblock the the funding conundrum um, of when you can have millions of pounds for a lovely laboratory and no one to stand in it. <laughs> it's, it it's a good point. And I think better understanding of research and the role it has and how it works has yeah. to be a good That's, thing yeah, anymore, yeah. right? It's an a, easy it's, win win. For and Christmas. it's something we should be super proud of within the UK. Yes. It's a huge part of, of who we are and a huge part um, as an asset to the country. Fantastic. So, agree. I think understanding when you're running a 10k and fundraising that you want that money to go directly to the research I can see that mm. I think that's why we'd invite UKRI when they look at the ecosystem of how do we make the books balance across all funding sources including charitable mm. industrial and government how do we do that together I think it's a really important question great opportunity a great thank opportunity. you uh, and last but by no means <laughs> least uh, Bill <laughs> this accent just need to you up um, it's for yourself Charmin the, 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 the charity research support fund has diminished its day has yep. a significant less value it would, it's becoming clear that um, charities are propping up that absence uh, they're, they're, they're filling that gap um, so the two questions how sustainable is that and what when that money's been diverted to prop up the, the lack of funding, what, what is losing out? What element of your desired research is losing out as a result of that money being um, drifted towards or migrating towards propping up uh, other elements of it? And how sustainable in the long term can you continue to do that? 
And that's the question, I think. So at the moment, I think we've talked about the squeeze on funding in a number of situations today in the previous session. And we're feeling that because actually making the business of doing world-class research viable and sustainable is become increasingly challenging. I think charities clearly have a role to play of it and we're hugely grateful for the funding we get from our charitable partners and all the people who support them. And indeed in the Institute, Which we've got... 50% our, of you. So we have um, half of our funding is grant funded and 65% of that charitable. We also have our own charitable charitable activity in-house, so we would bring in around between 13 and 16 million pounds through our own charitable efforts this year. And we work really hard at that because that helps us balance the books. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of the equation for us. But it is increasingly challenging, increasingly competitive, and the environment is increasingly tough. What, what we'd say, your question is such a good one about what suffers. I think increasingly, um, as we struggle to make the, the jigsaw fit and all the pieces fit, we lose some of the strategic view as a sector, and that's why we'd really encourage this opportunity for growth in terms of um, uh, um, the, the increase in GDP, really to fund, uh, to, to, look, to fund more of making the whole system work in a holistic way um, rather than particular, particular spots. I think this review is so important because without that um, big holistic view, I'm, I'm not sure we can make it sustainable. So, so you need to complete the jigsaw. Complete if we the do we have part finished jigsaw, we've exactly. got to get it all done. Yeah. And that takes cash. It does. Thank you. Finish, Bill? Yes, thank you. Unless Fantastic. You <laughs> uh, that's it. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, wish you all a very happy Christmas. And indeed to everybody else here as well and to fellow committee members. And, sorry? The viewers at home. The viewers at home. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and to the brilliant team who support us as well. So thank you all very much indeed. Order, thank you. order.